Hello and welcome. I'm Andreas Fertig. I work as a trainer and consultant primarily for C++. And I'm also the creator of C++ Insights. And this is also the tool I like to talk about in this series. In this episode, I will explain what C++ Insights is and give you a little introduction in where you can find it and how you can easily use it. So in today's episode, I like to talk about C++ 17. Today, I like to talk about a real huge feature in C++ 20, coroutines. But let's, for the beginning, um, focus on one thing um, that you might run into, which can cause you trouble. Um, before maybe in later episode we dissect coroutines um, a bit more and get a better understanding of it. So as you might know because we haven't standardized the generator part you see a lot of code here that I have to write but that's not really what we are going to talk about today. Just assume I have this generator and I have this function fun and my function fun here, obviously a coroutine because it co-returns and returns a generator type, uses a const in reference value and simply co-returns that value. Yeah. Yes, it's maybe not the most sensible function at this point, but I'm trying to make another point, so implementations are not really helping at this point. I set up my coroutine below here, pass the value 4 in, and I'm happily will run into trouble, then maybe less happy. It's also a good point or time to point out, um, please carefully read this notice here. Um, Coroutine transformations are heavily hand-coded. It's sometimes a lot of things that are not represented in the AST. It's an approximation. Um, please be aware when using them, okay? It's different than other transformations. Now if we go down here, um, we can see what a compiler does, and I'm fairly certain that um, this way may be slightly different, really close at least. So we can see that the compiler, um, if we maybe start here, has the function fun, and inside this we see a lot of more code, because the compiler applies um, various transformations to a coroutine function. So this is what you can see basically is the setup function. Briefly, we or the compiler allocates memory for the coroutine because the state has to be stored somewhere. Um, it allocates our promise type, it ensures the return object is there, and then it hooks up the resume and destroy function and it calls resume and at the end it returns the coroutine um, handle, you can say, in the current state. And below here, briefly, we see the resume function, and that one yeah, switches over an index, which is stored in our coroutine frame to find the correct um, resume point and does all the, the other stuff of the machinery. But that's not a focus of today. The focus of today is, let me go up here, we have it, the parameter or better the parameter type to my coroutine function, a const in reference. And what matters is mostly the reference part here. Um, the data type or the constness is not really that important. It's adjacent important, uh, important that it's a const reference. We see here the coroutine frame. Um, this is the struct that the compiler allocates here in line 91 where it stores all the information such that it's able to pause and resume our coroutine. Okay, so that's why we can see the resume and the destroy function here of promise type to suspend index and the parameters after all. Of course, all the parameters we pass to the generator, to our coroutine function, we can use it later um, in our example for a coroutine return. Okay, so that must be also stashed away in this coroutine frame in some section of our dynamic memory. And now the type of the parameters that the compiler stores in this coroutine frame 
are the exact same as we pass in. And in our case, because we are passing a const int reference as parameter type of our function fun, the according member in our coroutine frame is as well a const int reference value. And then we can see here on line 94 after the coroutine frame was allocated, the compiler now assigns the values from the parameters to the ones in the coroutine frame. I use stood forward here for the visualization, assume that a compiler might be a little bit better than, than um, that handwritten code here, but conceptually this is what happens. So the compiler forwards this value, tries to facilitate move semantics and, and all that. That's good, but in the end it means that we have a reference to something stored in our coroutine frame, and that's a const reference. And that const reference allows me to pass in a temporary object, or in my case a temporary value. And that means that this temporary value and object goes out of scope after we hit the semicolon, after the full expression comes to an end. And this is the semicolon. And that next then means that once I'm ready, I don't do that here, but ready to use my coroutine S, something that it points to in its coroutine frame may be no longer valid. In the case of this int here, you might not notice really the difference, because it's a constant, but once you pass in a std string object, for example, by const reference, and that's a temporary, then you have a good chance that you're looking at memory that no longer belongs to this std string, because there is no longer std string at this address. It's gone. So you have undefined behavior, more or less by default, if you pass in a const referent to a court. This is the crucial part for today. Be aware of that signature. The type in between doesn't matter, but constant reference allows you to pass in a temporary. The same, to some extent, is true for all value references. You can also bind on temporaries, but they get moved. But in this case, you're asking for trouble. If you use a type that's more or less a container type, then you potentially have guaranteed UB. Here it's UB, but you might not notice it. Pass by value, it's better in a lot of cases than it was in the past, and it's a real good thing to do for coroutines. So at this point, if you like to keep the const, that's fine for me, but remove the reference and Make sure you have valid code before you do the demonstration. And we can see we now have a const in value here. The compiler still does just try to do the best thing, but for an integer that's not really much to do. Now this value is safely stored or on the heap and we can use it at any point later without invoking undefined behavior. So this is something that's really fundamental in coroutines when creating them don't take reference parameters, at least not ones that can use a temporary or can catch a temporary. If I would have said int um, reference before, then the code would not have worked because I'm passing in a temporary and int reference cannot bind to a temporary. So that also relieves you from problems at this point, but then the code doesn't compile for other reasons. Now I would have to say something like and i equals four, and then I can pass in the variable i. Now this is a different scenario and might still generate you trouble um, because now in the coroutine frame you have a reference and that means that you have to ensure that this i lives longer than the coroutine, which in my case is true, but would not be any longer if we, for example, would return this coroutine from a different function than main, of course. So be aware of that. It's an easy pitfall you can run into and I want to save you from that. I hope you learned something and can enjoy core routines. That's it for today. Stay tuned for the next episode. Bye bye.